Hello, everyone, and welcome to this month's installment of the Talking Tim webinar series. My name is Kevin Vita, and I'll be helping with facilitating today's webinar. This webinar is sponsored by the Federal Highway Administration and hosted by the National Operations Center of Excellence, also known as NOCO. As a quick reminder, if you don't know already, at NOCO, we offer a variety of resources to support the transportation systems management and operations community. I'm going to quickly cover a couple logistics for today's webinar. First, you will see three poll questions appear in a pop-up window. If you could take a minute and complete those three questions for us, we would really appreciate that. The presentation slides will be sent to the attendees at the conclusion of today's webinar. All of the attendees are in listen-only mode by default, but we'd like you to stay engaged by using the chat box or the Q&A pod, for, well, the chat box for identifying yourself and the agency you represent as well as any additional comments and questions you have. There will be a Q&A session at the end of the webinar, so we encourage you to ask any questions you have during the presentations in the chat pod or the Q&A pod as they come to your mind at any time. The questions will be read out loud one at a time by the moderator and our presenters will answer each question. That's all I have, and with that, I'll hand it over to our moderator, Paul Joden, to start us off. Hey, thanks, Kevin. And then once again, thanks to uh, National Operations Center of Excellence for participating um, in hosting these webinars with us each month. Um, we really uh, appreciate the support and cooperation from you, from the co and from NOCO, and um, in particular you. It's awesome. So. Um, with that, uh, welcome to everybody uh, on behalf of Federal Highway, um, Tim Team, Jim Ostridge, uh, Joe Tebow, and myself. Um, welcome to this month's Talking Tim, and we're going to focus a lot on service patrols. And of course, I get a frog in my mouth as soon as I start talking. So um, next slide, please. So how we're doing this? Oh, there we go. Okay. Thank God. So uh, this is our disclaimer that um, when you know we're just sharing information. We're really not um, in a position to endorse or are interested in endor you know, endorsing anything. We're just sharing information. So, next slide. So this is the agenda today. I am very excited to have. Um, some close friends with us today presenting, an old friend and a new friend, um, newish friend. And um, uh, we're gonna talk, uh, we're gonna hear from Jennifer, from um, Jennifer Pernova from North Carolina Department of Transportation on uh, several things, the, the, the IMAP program, which is a safety service patrol program and some tools associated with it. And then uh, the research, the research, um, the, you know, the research program. And then in, Dr. Andy Bethune is going to be talking, uh, is the lead researcher on the research project for the safety service patrol pool fund study. And we'll be uh, explaining where we're at with that. So um, we'll have a question and answer and then a listening session time permitted time permitting and we always run out of time but hopefully we won't today so um if you recall everyday counts next gen tim technology for saving lives we try to touch a little bit on each webinar on each talking tim on um some some of the technologies that we're, we're trying to advance so today we'll be talking a little bit about the debris removal and uas for tim I'm going to give you some uh, updates real quick, federal highway updates uh, on a new fact sheet, Crash Responder Safety Week, stick funding, uh, some a cool event we had last weekend at the National Fire Academy, and um, an update on line of duty deaths. So the first thing we want to share is so um, our next generation, Tim, um, fact sheet, we updated it. Uh, the one we originally had out about um, uh, at the beginning of the Everyday Counts Initiative didn't fully describe the technologies that we're backing. So we updated it. It's a brand new one is, is there. It will help help you folks if you wanted to explain it to somebody. It's much easier to explain through the fact sheet, I believe. And um, uh, it's posted on our website. Also posted is a, 
uh, an analysis report that um, Federal Highway conducted on secondary crashes, uh, multi-state analysis. We didn't get, um, we don't, it's not an analysis of every state. We don't, we, 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 every state is not collecting secondary crashes, unfortunately. So try to push that in your state. If not, um, if not, um, but we, we did get enough information to, to, um, to make it into a, a publication and a report. And, um, you know, there it is on the federal highway website under what's new. So crash responder safety week is fast approaching and um, it's November 13th through 17th, second week in November every year. Uh, there'll be a national kickoff webinar on November 13th at 1 p.m. We urge you all to participate. We'd really, really appreciate it. We are not gonna have a Talking Tim uh, webinar in November um, because we're having the, the crash responder safety week um, webinar. So. Um, you know, it's going to be a pretty, pretty nice agenda. Um, so, um, please joining us. Some, um, not your, not our usual uh, speakers will be on on that. Will be um, some uh, very um, respectable. Not, not that we're not respectable, but how do I want to say some um, unique, different uh, speakers than we usually have. The hashtag, uh, the theme is protect those who protect you, hashtag CRSW. So there'll be a lot of, uh, um, a lot happening during that week. And um, one of those things will be through social media. So don't forget the hashtag within your state. Uh, uh, the long awaited uh, CRSW outreach toolkit is now available. Um, it's available on the Federal Highway website there. Um, you can see the um, the link, and uh, also on the no code website, I believe the same or similar uh, resources are available with that toolkit uh, as you push crash responder safety week in your region. So we wanted to talk to you a little bit about um, the State Transportation Innovation Council. Um, it's it, it's an incentive program that's uh, from Federal Highway, it's uh, um, $100,000 per state per fiscal year. Now we want it to be used for Tim, but it can be used for anything, uh, anything that the stick committee in each state determines it be used for, um, mostly for, but for innovation type things. It can't, you know, um, but in, and they determine that anything related to Tim is innovation because of, um, you know, we've, we've been involved with the Everyday Counts Initiative for, for so long. So um, we want to urge you to make sure that um, it's the new fiscal year, just started for October 1st. So uh, go at, go after your stick committee, if you could use 50 or 100,000 for something, and we all can use that, right? It, uh, one unique thing about um, 100,000, 50, 100,000, that, that money can go a long, long way. It's not like other funds needed in transportation, for example, that, that can go a long way with Tim. So next slide, please. So, um, you know, when you request it, you go to your state and transportation innovation council, there's a form you fill out. It's like a, day, a, a page and a half. It's very easy. It does require 20% match, uh, state match and, um, uh, uh, the applications are open through the entire fiscal year, but um, and it's a simple two page, as I said. Some examples there on the right, I won't read them to you, but uh, basically, um, I shouldn't say anything goes, but almost anything uh, that you can come up with that's Tim related is going to pass as long as it, if it passes the stick committee, it's going to pass, uh, you pass, you know, pass. The, the the approvers at Federal Highway. So, um, you know, you say, boy, I wish we had 50,000 or 75,000 for this. This is a, a way to go get it. We want it to be used for Tim, so get there first. Next slide, please. So these are some of the examples of what it was used for. I won't read the whole list to you, but co conferences, training, um, data, 
Um, I really like this last one that came out of Maine, Smart Road Safety Devices for Rural Responders. It's just a $20,000 request that they had, and they're buying some, um, you know, some of those advanced um, safety devices. I don't want to name which one it is because I'm not sure, but basically the, you know, some some safety devices that they can give rural responders. So you're killing a couple of birds with one stone there, right? you you're getting some um, some of the stick money for Tim, and then you're also using it for rural responders who who usually need need all all the help they can get. So, um, um, you know, I won't. But the bad news is, next slide, please. Bad news is not everyone in two, fiscal year 2023 that just finished didn't apply for them. So all these states left money on the table. So we don't want you to leave money on the table. So we want you to um, consider going after it and putting in a request. Chances are, if, if you know if these states left money on the table, then um, uh, if you're first in line, they'll like your idea and 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 go with it. So, all right, that's enough about the stick funding. Enough enough um, lecturing. We had an awesome event this weekend at the National Fire Academy. Um, we were only allowed to have uh, two two people per state. Um, uh, not everyone sent one, but 40, approximately 40, um, 42 states were represented, 100, 100 Tim professionals um, at the National Fire Academy for the weekend. It's a very uh, cool facility. It's, uh, you know, has its own cafeteria, its own pub. Basically, everyone stays in dorm rooms, stays for the weekend. Um, and we just had a, a tremendous discussion um, uh, on on um, all the things you see listed there. But we, you know, just a lot of the basics, uh, the TIM technology, the EDC program, training, TIM coalitions, TIM committees, um, and just, a, you know, there was a lot of very uh, advanced folks there. So um, uh, it was just a very motivating event. You see all the people there. You can't really see everybody's faces, but there was some heavy hitters there, as well as some new folks too, which we love to hear. The next generation, if you will, was there as well. So next slide, please. So the bad news is um, fatalities um, is at 33. Um, it's you know, it's still, I think, um, right, Vishal, it's still lower than it has been in previous years at this time in previous years. So we're tracking to be, uh, to continue in a downward trend. Uh, and I think it's all the work that you folks are doing out there that we're all doing collectively. So keep up the good work. Let's try to, um, let's try to, you know, make us, make this, uh, you know, a zero, zero number next for next October. Uh, no, that won't happen, but we got to continue to strive towards that. Next slide, please. Next one up. So when I said I have an old friend, sort of a new friend, Jeanette, Jennifer Pernover is an old friend. Not that she's old, but that she's a, a good and, um, and, uh, and solid friend uh, for a long time. And um, I'm stalling here because I didn't read her. Bring her introduction up, Vaishali. <laughs> um, got it now. Hold on. So I'm not guessing here. Oh, sorry. sorry, everybody is supposed to be ready for this. So Jennifer, just a, just a second on Jennifer. North Carolina is doing so many good things with Tismo and Tim and um and, and operations. It's just um uh, you know. Some years ago, they they were being restricted from, you know, from making advancements. But Jennifer pushed along, and now they have a tremendous program. There, Jennifer has um, she's a Tismo engineer, the statewide Tim, Tismo engineer, traffic systems management and operations engineer, uh, with 27 years experience in the transportation industry. She leads a various statewide Tim, Tismo programs, including incident management, travel information, ITS operations, TMC operations, single timing, uh, and and single and ITS design. She's a she's a professional engineer, certified public manager, operations academy graduate, and serves in various TIB and ASHTO CSTO committees. We're very honored to have Jennifer here today because she is well known nationally as well. So Jennifer, I think I'll be quiet and 
make sure I don't get myself in any more trouble than I'm already in. So thank you. Thanks, Jennifer. Thank you. All right. So I'm going to talk a little bit today about some things we're doing in North Carolina. And then um, I want to talk a little bit about um, how we are, um, we have some needs for safety service patrol research um, and what we're doing to address that. Um, so if you could go to the next slide. Um, one of the things I want to talk about is our tether drone, which was the EDC six and seven initiative. Um, and uh, Paul talked about using stick funds for initiatives. And this is one of the initiatives that we were able to use stick funding for. Um, this came from a need for situational awareness of what's going on on our, in, you know, at our incident scenes. Um, and we originally looked into um, equipping our safety service patrol with drones and realized really quickly how much training is required to man drones. Um, and so instead of given, you know, going through the training, we actually purchased some drones for the highway patrol. And we uh, had an MOU where if we needed them to fly drones for situational awareness, they would do that. And that worked pretty well. Um, we, you know, because we invested in drones for the highway patrol, they were using for crash reconstruction, which is always a plus because it helps to clear incidents quicker. Um, however, you know, every time we needed to see, our, our goal was to see what was the traffic impacts. They were flying drones for reconstruction and it would be our, our ability to be able to see the impacts to traffic was delayed. And so we said, is there another way we can do it to be able to focus on areas that we want to see? Um, we've looked into CCTVs or cameras on our, our IMAP truck. Our IMAP is our safety service patrol. Um, and the challenges with cameras on trucks are that, you know, you have to deal with how to extend it, the wind, you know, and so we thought, well, maybe these drones are a creative way to be able to see more. Um, and is there a way that we can do this without all the training that's needed to fly drones? So that's when we started investigating tether drones. Um, what tether drone did offer to us was uh, less training. There's still some uh, checklist and things that we have to go through in order to fly a drone in certain locations, but it's it, a lot easier for our to, to get somebody up to speed and trained in like a day's time on how to fly a drone. And so we um, applied for some stick funding and we purchased two drones, um, two different types of drones so we could figure out two different types of tether drones so we can figure out what suited our needs the most. Um, we took these drones and we moved them across the state in different places um, and uh, to see where, you know, one, how easily, how mobile they were, um, where do we need them the most. Um, we have a pretty large state and our state is mainly rural, but we have some urban areas. So, you know, did they work better, you know, in urban areas, rural areas, that kind of thing. So if you go to the next slide. Um, some of the things that we noticed and uh, this first comment here is is really to support the back of queue monitoring is what we wanted to use them for it's it's really hard to get people to um, look at that they want to look at the crash and so some of our training included you know what because we want to get the video back to the traffic management center so they can then manage traffic put up messages and so some of the challenges were um, getting folks to look at the traffic and manage the traffic versus look at the um, the crash itself or the incident itself. Um, some of the challenges with doing a pilot with two drones for a state as large as ours is the drone never happened to be in the place where we needed it, um, the incident. Um, another challenge was because it's a cool toy, everybody wanted to show it off at a conference. And so, you know, the, the drone might be at a conference somewhere when we needed it for an incident. Um, the other thing we found out is we need to have um, a champion and somebody who, under, you know, knows that the drone is there, is accessible. The drone is accessible to them when they need to, they need it, um, and it doesn't need to be a safety service patrol driver. That's the other thing we found out, that we want them to be focused on putting out the emergency traffic control. Um, we gave drones to our IMAP supervisors who have a, you know, a more big, bigger picture, but even that, was a challenge when they should be um, part of incident command. And so some of the things that we learned is it may need to be a dedicated um, individual that's not in safety service patrol. 
We also, because these drones don't get used as often, um, and I say as often, they get more, they would get more use in, we found in rural areas where we had less camera coverage, urban areas, they really didn't get used as often. Um, and we haven't, knock on wood, haven't had a big emergency in the last couple of years where um, we, when we have big emergencies, the drones, whether they're tethered or not, get used quite a bit for situational awareness because our, our coastal area is very rural, doesn't have a lot of camera coverage. So we, we do see the value in drones, um, but we also see some, some challenges with that. And um, we certainly would be willing to meet with any state that is considering this to talk about some of the things that we've noticed. Um, we now have two drones. Um, one of them is to, is actually in a region um, this morning. I ask, you know, where is how's the drone being used now? You know, one of the drones. There's some pros and cons with different types of drones. Some that are tethered with a full package. You know, they're easy to deploy. Some that are regular drones that are tethered to a, a, a box may not be as easy, and so. We're trying to figure out what do we do with these drones and do we purchase more drones um, and does it make sense? So we're willing to have a more um, uh, honest conversation with any states that want to talk about that. We've talked about these drones a lot. And I'm going to go to the next slide and kind of talk about the use case that we presented. Um, some of these examples on this slide are actually other stick initiatives that we uh, were deploying at the same time. We tried emergency vehicle alerts where we used um, three different uh, manufacturers of emergency vehicle alerts using stick funding to uh, evaluate that. We were uh, we did a pilot with Recore, um, the Waze alert, uh, not Waze alert, uh, yeah, Waze was one of the stick grants, and there was another one on this list that uh, DriveWise, not sure if that was a stick grant, but it was going on at the same time. So we had this. Once we just de deployed these uh, drones out to the region, we had the perfect storm of an incident that occurred on I-95. We were able to use all the tools all at the same time to show the value of, of these tools. Um, and this is an example where, in this case, we were able to use the drone to, in real time, um, use signal system timing, update the timing of the signal. So we were it was a, a crash that occurred. We were detouring traffic off the ramp. Um, in this area, we had an integrated corridor project, but the ramp signal was not tied to the alternate route. And so we had somebody in real time looking at the um, signal and the traffic coming off the ramp and adjusting the signal timing in, in real time. And so if you go to the next slide, I'm gonna show you a quick video of, of that. Um, picture, you can see all the traffic up the top on the right that are exiting off and that signal at the bottom of the ramp was where we had um, the timing issue and somebody was timing that signal. It looks like it didn't, yeah, it's kind of glitching a little bit, but in this case, and there was a lot of, uh, we had a emergency vehicle alert here for a vehicle that was actually on um, the not the main line, but the uh, cross street. And a lot of, like I said, a lot of the tools were being used all at the same time. This was a great example of, of how it could be used. Now, the question is, you've got to have, again, a champion and somebody making sure that they're, this tool is being used all the time. So you go on to the next slide. This is a next slide. We're going to talk about another initiative we just applied for stick um, funding to pilot different debris removal tools for our uh, map. Um, and we've purchased one tool and some of the tools that we're purchasing are actually not the tools, they're designs that we're gonna try and uh, modify. One of the things that's really important to us, our uh, map can clear um, vehicles uh, and out of the lane before law enforcement arrives. And so what we don't wanna do is modify our um, equipment on our truck to the point we can't do some of that so we have winches we have um, push bumpers. We don't want to. We want it to integrate into the truck itself, so we still do some of the things that um, not some. We want to continue to do all the things that we're already doing and not sacrifice any of that. Um, in the past, we have um, piloted some tools that didn't um, 
could be more dangerous than helpful as far as capturing the debris. So we wanted to make sure the tool that we're using can capture the debris so it doesn't bounce off to the, in the other direction of traffic. Um, we don't want it to damage our roadway or pavement markings. Um, and then I already mentioned the impact to the vehicle equipment. So if you go to the next slide, here are some of the um, different tools that we're gonna be piloting using the stick funding to purchase um, these and see what works the best for North Carolina. And we'll certainly, for every one of these stick projects, we have to do a final report. So if there's anything you heard me talk about that you're interested in our um, conclusion, um, feel free to email me and we can send you a report um, on any of those. We've actually applied, I know this presentation one is, wasn't about the stick grant because, but because Paul mentioned it, we apply for a stick funding every year for initiative, a TISMO initiative. And every year for the last probably seven years, we have gotten some funding, if not all of the funding that's available. So I do really encourage states to, to um, uh, apply in their state. We even asked Paul if we could um, get money from the other states that weren't applying, but he said no. So, uh, all right, moving on. This is just an example. Um, Paul talked about emergency responders that are getting struck by, and this is the reason that we are um, piloting these debris removal tools. Um, we have some processes in place for how we would remove debris without the tools, and you can see, you can read through here and see how we position and park. It's still very dangerous, um, and we want to um, make our uh, our drivers as safe as possible. And so that's just the the reason for the prototype. I mean, for the um, not prototype, but for the pilot. Thank you. All right, next slide. All right, now I'm gonna move. I'm gonna switch gears. Still talking about safety service patrol. Want to talk about research needs. So um, if you if you know me, you know that safety service patrol is something that I really value and is near and dear to my heart. Um, and uh, back in 2017-18, um, GDOT uh, asked about if anybody was interested in being part of a safety service patrol industry association at one of the um, AASHTO CTSO annual meetings. I was trying to see how many acronyms I could throw into there. I did spell it out uh, verbally, but... Um, ASHTO is a place where all states get together and they talk about uh, different it, um, initiatives that they're working on uh, as it relates to um, TISMO. And so industry association was attractive to us in North Carolina because we had invested a lot of time and energy into creating standards for our safety service patrol, documenting things. Tra develop and training. And so um, we jumped right on it as, as well as several other states um, were interested in doing that. And so the industry association initiatives were intended to kind of, you know, create some unity about the safety service patrol, provide some support um, and some awareness for the, the profession. Um, many times we're working in other uh, individually in each state talking about what we want to do. We do reach out to other states and ask them what they're doing with service patrol, but there's not a real, um, there was not a place other than a few um, uh, groups that would talk about Tim, but it wouldn't necessarily be safety service patrol focused. And so that brought us together, a, probably a group of about seven or eight, and there was some industry folks that were involved in that. What happened though is um, because GDOT was taking the lead, their funding for that, um, to, to spearhead that, um, I guess they, they got a new contract that wasn't the, the priority at the time. And so um, the rest of us who were part of that decided we needed to find somebody to um, shepherd it. And um, so in 2020 um, or 2021, several of us states started hassling uh, federal highways and said, we really think that this initiative for safety service patrol fits within federal highways. Um, Paul was quite reluctant at first, but after I twisted his arm a couple times and it wasn't just me, but there were other states that said, we really do think you know, federal highways and they were federal highways to their credit. Um, do support safety service patrol. It's just, you know, every time somebody comes and asks you to do something, 
um, more. And we as a state just didn't feel like we could take that on for the whole na- in the nation. And so we were looking for a home for it where it made sense. And so in 2021, we um, basically developed the, the beginnings of a pool fund study. That's what the, the PFS is at the bottom. So if you go to the next slide, the idea was to pull all these states together and talk about best practices, lessons learned, document, you know, there, every time we talk to a state about their uh, um, safety service patrol, we learn something even, and we are, you know, I, I feel like we are pretty mature in our program, but we, there's still so much to learn. There's still so many things that we can get from other states. There was just not a repository for all this information. Um, we were, independently working on things like um, emergency traffic control, uh, the MUTCD, it does not tell you how to set up emergency traffic control. It tells you a lot about temporary traffic control and how to set up for um, planned events, but it doesn't really tell you about emergency situations. Kind of gives you two pages of very broad guidance. So we had developed our own standards. um, And not only did we want to share with other states what we were doing, but we wanted to learn what other states were doing. And so um, with some other states, and I'll show you who those are in just a minute, we got together and we developed this pool fund study, or we we didn't develop the pool fund study. We asked Federal Highways, can you put together a pool fund study and we can help contribute? And I believe that um, either Paul or Andy in just a minute will talk exactly about how you can contribute. But if you go to the next slide, Here's, a, here's all the states that are part of this current pool fund study. This pool fund study is open to any state that wants to come in and participate now. I mean, we have, I think, been doing this maybe for a year and a half now. Um, we are, It's open. You can contribute your research dollars. And um, if I say this wrong, Paul, you can correct me, but I believe... Federal Highways gives the states research dollars that they can then invest in different pool fund studies that they want to be part of. Um, And there's many pool fund studies out there, but this one is specific to safety service patrol. And so all of these states together are coming together, sharing their best practices, sharing their standards, so that then it can be incorporated in eventually, hopefully, into some practices that are more a national um, best practice for for the, the whole country. If you go to the next slide, this is um, a, just kind of uh, showing you what we have accomplished since 2022. We got started. Andy's going to give you a more detailed presentation of the information he's gathered. Um, they, you know, a lot of what has happened is us coming together, talking, and every time we get together, there's always something that more to talk about. We've had um, an annual meeting together where we we've shared. We brought them to North Carolina. We shared what was going on with our training and our Tim track, um, and then we Andy and team Volpe has, has uh, interviewed different states. And what he's going to share is some of the the outputs research. We call it research right now. It's interviews and collecting a lot of information, but some of those things that have been learned through that and and documented. So let's see, if you go to the next slide, this is a link, and I think they'll put this in the chat. This is a link to the pool fund study. Um, And if you have any questions about how to um, contribute, here's here's some names here that you can get um, that can help you. You can also send in your information about your standards, even if you're not part of the pool fund study, just to get, you know, a bigger uh, understanding of what's going on in the country. So... Anything else, Paul, with that, that you want to share about the pool fund study and how to get involved? Yeah, I'll, I'll share a few, a few things here. Yeah, so to get involved, um, you know, so each each state gets research dollars, federal research dollars. Each DOT gets gets the money. So we're, we're just asking for $25,000 for, for those states that want to participate. A few states um, contributed more. Some could, I think one might have contributed slightly less, but um, uh, so it's not, you know, you don't have to ask anyone to write a check. You just need to go to your research office. You need to reach out to your re- research office and you and you, um, you know, you will um, just ask them 
and and they they know how to do this. They would like to contribute and participate in this pool fund study. So um, it's really that simple. I can um, uh, I can you know walk you through it if you reach out to me after this webinar or or you know anytime anytime after. But those states that are participating. Um, ironically, are some of the best states in the country for service patrols, right? So we want everybody. It's 16 states, uh, and most of them are very strong programs, you know. Um, but, you know, we, 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 there's other programs, I think, that would benefit um, tremendously from hearing it. One of the best parts of this, and one of the reasons Jennifer, um, uh, you know, asked me, twisted my arm, uh, twisted both arms, actually, but um, was because of the conversations that can happen you know there's unique challenges for those managers that run these service patrol programs and and uh and and so there were some good discussions so all of our meeting we have a quarterly meeting coming up november 1st and we we set time aside a couple of hours anyways for open discussion what's on your mind what can we do and there's we always run out of time because there's, there's a lot to talk about when you're when you're um you know when you have a similar similar uh, goals and challenges um so um yeah that's it and and just a little bit you know the reason why i was i had to um decline um i declined um john mcclellan called me from minnesota i said oh no i can't do it i don't have the bandwidth i just don't you know and then um Jason Josie had called me. The people in Georgia had. We, what can we do? What can we do? And the only thing I can think of was a pool fund study. Um, and then when Jennifer, you can't say no to Jennifer. So um, uh, that's when we decided. But but just so you know, it wasn't because we didn't. Um, you know, safety service patrols are near and dear to our heart at Federal Highway. Jim Ostrich, my partner, ran the Washington D.C. program, a program in Washington D.C., and I ran one in Massachusetts for many years. So we it wasn't because we didn't want to, but it was just because the uh, you know the 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 challenges. But we um, we were able to um, sort of walk that fine line by getting in some great support from Volpe to actually pull and do most of the prog uh, project together. And we have some of the Volpe people on today, so I want to thank them. Um, Don um, is on. Don France is on. And um, and you'll hear from Andy in a second. So um, is what else? Is it? Yeah. Yeah. So um, I think I have, you know, I think I've covered it all um, that, you know, you know, just urging everybody to participate. We're continuing. We're, we're making good progress at the research. You'll hear from Andy. But I urge your state or if you're not the right person from your state to, to reach out again. It's not a big deal. It's just a matter of telling your research office that's we you know you'd like to spend the money. Of course, they have the research office doesn't decide how they're going to spend their research dollars, but it's a small amount of money that can go a long, long way, and it has so far. So, uh, with that, we urge you to participate with us. So, Jennifer, thanks very much. Really appreciate um, you twisted my arm way back when, uh, if not the first time, I might add, and um, and then um, and for presenting for us today. So. With that, I'll introduce my um, other friend who is uh, a newer friend. Um, he's one of my best friends though now because he's really smart. He's a great researcher from Volpe and there's, he's not the only researcher from Volpe, but he is the lead researcher. So um, Andy Bethune has, has a PhD uh, and works at the US DOT Volpe Center, and that's in Cambridge. By the way, that's where we're going to have our annual meeting next year in May, a uh, brand new building in, Bo in Boston. So anyways, um, and Andy leads a portfolio focus on focusing on traffic safety and operations, automated and connected vehicles, traffic modeling, and an in, in, uh, intelligent transportation system. He is a member of the TRB's Committee on Traffic Simulation and has taught graduate engineering courses at University of Massachusetts Lowell. Um, and um, yeah, and so with that, I'll let Andy take it on and I will disappear here. Thanks, Andy. Except you're on mute, Andy. Is that better? That is better, yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for the awesome intro. Um, the uh, 
Um, I'm Andy Bertome. I, uh, you know, uh, with the USDOT Volpe Center. For those of you who don't know what that is, uh, we're a uh, uh, federal lab uh, does a lot of R&D into transportation related research. <clears throat> we're not directly funded by uh, the USDOT. Uh, we usually, uh, the way we operate is usually if, you know, federal highway or um, a state DOT has like a, a question or a concern, um, uh, they usually uh, reach out to us and then chunk off a little budget for us to do the research and, um, you know, we'll uh, do the R&D and publish the reports. Um, you, you probably sent our work in, in a lot of places, but usually we were kind of quiet and operate on the sidelines. Um, the uh, uh, Can we uh, go to the next slide? Perfect. Um, this is one of the opportunities, um, one of the one of the projects where we have the opportunity to work um, directly with a lot of people who are um, making a direct con contribution to the roadways. And um, this is a, um, it, it's it's one of the, uh, it's a topic that's a lot of fun to be working with, working on, um, and uh, the people that we've uh, had the opportunity to interact with uh, thus far are just absolutely amazing. Um, <clears throat> the uh, uh, again, this is a, a pool fund study uh, where we're looking at safety service patrols, um, and we're trying to basically uh, consolidate. We're starting off by consolidating practices. We're trying to advance basically to um, uh, provide materials to help advance the field uh, and the practice. Uh, before we actually get into that, if you can go to the next slide, um, uh, not a lot of, not too sure if everybody knows what an SSP actually is. Um, We wanted to take a quick poll. Just to know what it may not be called an S safety service patrol in your state. There's all, all different names for it, but the generic name nationally is safety service patrol. Give it a couple more seconds. Um, can we uh, display the, the poll results? Awesome. Oh, that's okay. That's perfect. So it looks like uh, uh, about a quarter uh, respondents are actually a uh, part of an SSP program. Um, and um, only about 16% uh, not familiar with SSP programs. Um, the, uh, if we could uh, head to the next slide, um, our uh, the safety service patrols are uh, kind of a critical component to a working operate, you know, working a traffic system. Uh, the, uh, in, in many, in many states and many, uh, regions and locales, they do everything from, uh, removing hazardous roadway debris, you know, shredded tires, et cetera, from the roadway. Um, uh, you know, an animals that have been struck by a vehicle, um, they, they remove the hazardous materials, those hazardous, those roadway hazards from the, from the roadway. Um, they also respond to uh, disabled vehicles and, and essentially uh, do the uh, responding to taking addressing the issue while um, providing traffic management and ensuring nobody hits um, or um, is endangered by the uh, uh, the current situation. Um, uh, these folks are often, uh, you know, since these responders are uh, on the roadway, a lot of them are, uh, you know, in harm's way. They, these are the people who are on the roadside who are, um, you know, some of the most vulnerable people um, when it comes to our roadway users, um, you know, as, as are many of the, the folks on the phone right now um, in these other capacities. So this is, um, you know, this is the, the people that we want to, um, we want to provide uh, top-notch, top-quality um, uh, protection and uh, services um, just to, to kind of help advance the field. Um, when uh, when we got involved, uh, uh, Jennifer and um, and the and the the rest of the PFS group had and and Paul had had, had scoped out the the problems and uh, basically came up with the solution of having this kind of a, a, a peer program, um, and uh, that's really the approach that we've been taking. Is, is we've been we started off by trying to uh, collect, consolidate, and report back out on uh, not just best practices, but starting off with you know what are the practices. Um, there's a number of different, uh, you know, state by state, program by program issues that can kind of uh, bog down certain uh, certain uh, portions of different programs, and and knowing how other states have resolved that, um, knowing how other programs have gotten around that, um, it can actually be helpful. Um, so collecting and consol consolidating those practices so that um, we can have a bit of a peer to peer, 
Um, and then results, we wanted to report everything back out in kind of a phase one report where we do talk about um, those uh, those practices and, and come up with that uh, structure to describe them so that we can kind of use that as a, as a baseline to move forward. Um, <clears throat> we've been... Uh, uh, We've been we we host quarterly calls um, with uh, all the SSP uh, pool fund study members, uh, not just to, as a sanity check to make sure that you know what we're doing and and the, what we're reporting, what we're finding makes sense and is useful and uh, helpful information in the end, but it's also to kind of provide that forum so that everybody can touch base and um, uh, get a second la layer of utility um, where there is a bit of a peer to peer element. Um, you know, uh, provided uh, so, you know, folks can learn more directly from each other as well as, you know, the report and everything else that we're doing. Um, we'll all, we're also generating the state of the practice report, which does focus on emergency traffic control and uh, vehicle equipment loadout, but also just tries to provide a, a basic structure and framework for the entire SSP, um, the, the world of the SSP. Um, our, our phase one approach really has been uh, some significant data collection, obviously, you know, outlining the report, uh, coming up with basically a structured and annotated outline, ensuring that what we're about to produce is actually not only useful, um, but, uh, you know, is, is this, this is going to be something that actually does provide utility and is helpful, uh, but also is this something that, you know, we're setting ourselves up for success versus um, about to bang our heads against the wall? Um, is this Is this doable? Um, we uh, collected a lot of information from the pool fund study uh, members. A lot of folks contributed a, a lot of really good information, both uh, through interviews and through the materials they did submit. Um, and we uh, basically broke it down, summarized everything, and um, we're creating that final report, which we're hoping to have uh, draft one, version one uh, available to the PFS uh, members for review. Um, uh, we're, we're, hope we're, we're hoping within the next few weeks here. Um, to have that out. Can we go to the next slide? <clears throat> so our, our data collection right now, we're, we're really just, um, uh, we're trying to drink from the fire hose here. We're trying to collect and consolidate as much as information as we can about SSP programs, uh, what some of the uh, issues and Hurdles that they've encountered have been uh, not just in, in current programs, but in the past, um, whether it's, uh, you know, that the program was framed in a certain way and, and that kind of met with some resistance through, you know, other decision makers at DOTs, um, uh, or if it was something where, um, you know, this, if you have these relationships established and, and, and this A, B, and C uh, well planned out and well coordinated, that you kind of uh, grease the rails um, and, and things will move uh, much much easier uh, and you'll have an easier time and a much more effective time when addressing roadway incidents. Um, but we uh, collected this information from the SSP programs, manuals, memoranda, um, and basically anything that anybody was willing to provide. Um, we did our own lit review as well, uh, looking online, not just the reports, but um, at um, uh, what publicly available information for each one of these programs. Um, we uh, uh, digested as much of the information as we could um, and broke it down into, you know, its constituent components. Uh, we um, and we had, had follow up meetings with each one of these PFS members to interview and kind of uh, confirm what we found and, and, and garner additional information. Um, and uh, all of that is kind of feeding into this into this report. I wanted to start off by talking about the interviews and our, pro our process and findings. Go to the next slide. Um, this, uh, thank you. The interviews were, uh, kind of, a uh, when we first started off on this project, one of the things that we noted was, uh, that these, these programs, um, they evolve, uh, pretty quickly. Some of them, uh, they're, uh, they're, they're a bit of a moving target. Um, one of the folks that we interviewed with, uh, one of the States, um, we had, uh, um, met in May, uh, as, as a group and I, we had written down, this is the, you know, what, what's currently going on in the practice. By the time that we had met with them uh, two months later, um, we found out that uh, there was leaps and bounds that they had advanced, a, 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 accomplished a, a ton more and, and gotten a lot more done um, to uh, kind of advance and enhance their communications and coordination efforts. Um, and from what I've heard, they, I, I think they've actually, uh, there's, there's even more updates uh, uh, recently. So the um, these interviews, we've interviewed 16 uh, PFS um, 
uh, over SSP programs uh, that were that participated in, in some way uh, through the uh, the pool fund study. Uh, we've uh, had some uh, kind of standardized questions, but we also had other questions to kind of probe and get a little bit more information. Um, but uh, essentially, we use this to um, uh, these high level findings are going to be used to report it out in the um, SSP report. Uh, we're going to there are we drafted a, a series of state profiles. Um, which we're going to be distributing to the states to just double check and, and make sure that they're okay with us saying what we're saying um, and, and, and that the phraseology is prop, uh, um, appropriate. But um, essentially, this is uh, one of the cornerstones of the report is um, uh, what folks have uh, kind of self-reported uh, in terms of uh, their programs. We can go to the next slide. Um, so this information that we're going to, uh, that we're uh, on the slide right now, <clears throat> Uh, this has all been kind of uh, bounced off of the PFS members, um, and um, and verified by the the, the folks who are uh, in this study. So, um, uh, essentially, one of the one of the first things that that we noticed was the unbelievable variety within these programs. Uh, the uh, SSP, SSP programs in, in general uh, they they vary significantly, and it's not just state to state; it's also region to region. Uh, different regions have different problems, different priorities, and different goals. Um, and uh, you see heavy variances in not just the PFS programs, but how they're set up and uh, what those priorities are based off of some of the core DOT or transportation agency that is overseeing and administrating um, uh, each one of these uh, programs. Um, there's like a, a very easy to um, kind of a very accessible example where if you think about like, you know, some of these that you there's a number, high number of significant uh, special events, like big football games, et cetera. And they have uh, some of these SSP programs, their SSP trucks are used um, to help do some of the traffic coordination, some of the planned traffic management around those. Whereas uh, other ones uh, have been used for hurricane and significant weather events. And uh, we've gotten reports of people, you know, needing to mount giant pumps in the back of their trucks um, to uh, mitigate, you know, roadway flooding. Um, a lot of SSPs, you know, is operate in an urban area where you're trying to improve reliability. So, you know, hitting the peak hour, um, the peak hours, um, and um, a quick clearance uh, with minimum disruption to traffic is really the um, the core driver there. And then there's even folks, you know, in rural mountainous regions with you know, heavy trucking routes where uh, disabled heavy vehicle is actually harder to move uh, due to the, uh, the the roadway grades. Um, and uh, you may not have significant shoulder clearance or great, you know, sight lines and visibility due to the curves in the mountains. So um, it's important to, uh, you know, enhance visibility, but also have uh, vehicles with the horsepower to clear that vehicle um, out of harm's way as soon and as effectively as possible. Different states have different laws, et cetera, that do limit and um, and or uh, assist with the uh, each one of these programs, their growth and their um, sustained operation. So um, because of that, we have different Pro, different programs at different fleet sizes that range significantly with the with the trucks that are equipped. There are, for the most part, there's a, a couple of standard, couple of basic platforms that are, are pretty ubiquitous across program to program for the majority of them. But um, the fleets do range from 310 program, trucks to about 15. Um, and um, when it comes to staffing these, this uh, it's, it's another it's another thing that does kind of uh, shift greatly from program to program, you know, whether or not um, the state agency is allowed to hire new full-time staff versus whether or not um, uh, it's more cost efficient uh, and economical to have contracted staff versus a mix. Funding models and levels, of course, are uh, humongously important. Um, you know, some of these programs, they're, you know, five year by five year, year by year um, contracts. They're, they're not, um, uh, you know, it, it, it's not, uh, it's not been approved by the state Congress yet. It, it's something that is like uh, interval by interval versus there are those that have had a uh, longer term kind of uh, backing from um, from legislation, from state legislation that does um, uh, ensure their continued operation over time. Uh, and of course, like coverage, the where and when you, when you, uh, these uh, SSPs operate obviously has a, a huge, it's humongously governed by the, um, uh, the issues and the the core goals of each one of these SSP programs, whether it's, you know, we're only doing the urban roadways um, in during peak hour um, because we're trying to improve reliability uh, with on, on these corridors versus 
Um, again, if you're doing something that's a little bit more, um, you know, where this is a heavy vehicle trucking route and um, in a mountainous region and uh, patrol hours and, and, and service types need to kind of vary. Um, <clears throat> and of course, the incident types that are uh, addressed are, are going to vary as well. Uh, every state, every region, every locale has a, has its different and unique uh, transportation difficulties. Um, and, um, and you see these programs kind of vary as they cater to these, uh, to, to addressing these, these issues. Um, can we go to the next slide? One of the, uh, this, this is probably not surprising to most people, but one of the near ubiquitous issues that, that, we, that were reported was funding, long-term funding, um, uh, that it's, uh, it's often, uh, difficult or, um, challenging to secure um, a substantial amount of um, uh, long-term uh, dedicated funding for these programs. Um, the um, There are some states that have found some effective solutions and uh, worked with partners in, in, in ways that um, have yielded uh, a decent amount of benefit. Next slide. There's other challenges as well. Um, uh, one of the one of the biggest problems besides funding was was retention, recruitment and retention of the, the proper staff. Um, a lot of folks um, had reported uh, that uh, this tends to be that a lot of their um, SSP members, uh, the, their SSP operators, um, some of them come from the retired uh, police officers, state troopers um, and others who are very familiar with, uh, you know, they're, they're trained and, and indoctrinated in how to approach a vehicle and how to do it safely and securely. Um, that being said, uh, that's that training is, is 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 hard to unlearn. And if you're doing something, if your SOP is a little bit different uh, when you're operating one of these vehicles, um, it, it 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 is hard to unlearn that and then relearn it here. So training is also an important thing, um, and how to how to basically leverage the skills of those people who who have learned how to effectively approach a, a scenario safely and 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 to 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 approach a vehicle in a scenario safely. Um, leveraging the, the skills and talents that they've kind of acquired and honed in um, and, and doing that in, in, a, in a way that kind of yields the best results. Um, next slide. Um, contract staff versus agency staff seems to be one of those things that um, it's not... There is there isn't an, an overwhelming majority that goes one way or the other. Uh, this seems to be a, a pretty pretty dead split between the two um, within uh, the PFS members at least. Um, uh, this is um, obviously these two different business models uh, are very they're significantly different in the way that they're set up and that they operate, um, and there are uh, different concerns um and different uh, things that need to be addressed for each one of these models. One of them being liability and uh, like it. Uh, liability for incidents, you know, financial damages, et cetera. Um, I think that's a, an easy one to kind of, you know, uh, grab onto is, is something like that, that you, if you have a contractor who's fully insured, it's a little bit different than uh, the state. And especially if the state has a limited liability law um, that protects state drivers, it's, it's uh, you know, there's, there's different concerns that need to be um, accounted for. Next slide. Um, I wanted to take a couple of polls before we got into the next sets of slides. Um, if for those of you who um, are familiar with your SSP program, um, wanted to know if uh, anybody has uh, formal protocols or guidance documents um, uh, that are published, um, something that is you know in writing and um, uh, it, it doesn't have to be available to the public, but you know, essentially, if it's if it's a, something that's in writing and and, uh, and available, this can include, um, uh, you know, uh, your uh, formal. You know, this is this is how how you're supposed to act and how you're supposed to approach each one of these scenarios. We'll give the poll another five seconds. And can we show the results? Oh, that's all. wow. Okay. Um, this is one of the areas that we had noted. Um, a lot of uh, a lot of the PFS members had uh, mentioned that uh, kind of producing and sharing 
and publishing some of these protocols and these guidance documents is actually a um, a bit of a difficulty. Um, uh, there was an example given in one of the um, one of our meetings that made it very accessible, um, where if there's a, a crash and the S, it's it's a crash due to the SSP vehicle um, and and the SSP vehicle responder. If the responder didn't follow the guidance that was published, then the program is liable. But if the responder did follow the guidance and a crash still occurred, the program can still be liable. So um, there was concerns where, um, you know, publishing does wind up kind of uh, making you a little bit more vulnerable um, from a liability standpoint and um, that there are, it is easier to have it and not publish it than to have it and publish it. Um, we have another poll on the next slide. Um, it has to do with, uh, formal trainings, manuals, or curricula. Um, one of the things that uh, if we can open up the poll, one of the, the, the reasons for asking this question. So um, what, what reported almost across the board is that um, uh, the, the better you train, not just your drivers and your dispatchers, um, but your call centers, uh, the, the better and cleaner your, your program is going to wind up operating. Um, <clears throat> and uh, the more you have uh, kind of uh, either MOUs or training available for uh, local agencies, local police agencies, uh, state police agencies, et cetera, all the other folks who are going to be on scene with you, uh, the better that you have that coordination defined and that training available, um, the smoother things are going to go when folks arrive on the scene. Uh, they're going to arrive on scene, you know, obviously now knowing exactly what their roles, responsibilities are, um, and uh, quick clearance is uh, easier to, to achieve. Um, so uh, having you know this training material and curricula developed uh for these different folks for for everybody who's going to be on scene but uh also having that kind of maintained and updated and published is um one of the things that folks had said would uh, contribute to a better program we can close the poll now yeah the um uh, not surprised by the um not sure uh, at almost 50 percent um this was another one that uh, folks had said um, the materials usually don't get published um, uh, for for multiple reasons, multiple concerns. Um, but the um, you know if anything is there, it's it's usually kind of kept internally within the department. Um, we can go to the next slide. Um, as Jennifer had mentioned earlier, if we can open up the poll, um, if Jennifer had mentioned earlier, um, emergency traffic control. Um, you know, chapter six, I think it's six I in the METCD um, talks a lot about um, has has some some content there. Um, here we go. Chapter six I, you know, has, has some content for te temporary traffic control uh, within the context of an um, incident, but um, it isn't prescriptive about how to handle that or or what should be done. Um, and um, the uh, having that. Um, established can be very helpful, especially when it comes to multi-agency coordination. Um, you know, just, just having that emergency traffic control plan written and established um, uh, for a variety of different scenarios. I'll give this five more seconds. In close-up poll. It's yeah, it's uh, about the same as, as what we've been hearing. Um, the uh, you know that um, much like the guidance and um, and training materials um, is usually not published. It's not publicized that this um, that this exists. It's usually in, yeah, internal purposes only. Um, for what it's worth, these are the uh, materials that uh, they're they're harder to, for us to to find and come by. So if you do have, if, you, if you're aware of uh, e either your your training, uh, if you have. Uh, if you're allowed to have and are allowed to share trainings and protocols or publish guidance um, or emergency traffic control plans, uh, please do. Please reach out. Uh, we could we could use it. Um, uh, it's uh, it's it's important to see how how other states and how other programs are handling this um, and uh, and approaching these um, these these kind of critical pillars of um, uh, for their SSP programs. Um, we can go to the next slide. Um, I wanted to give a little bit of a high level description of the contents of our report, uh, what we're kind of, um, what we're plan intending to to, uh, to to report back out on. Um, if you go to the next slide, 
um, the, uh, <clears throat> you know, there was a 2017 um, a Federal Highway publication on SSPs um, that provided a lot of, uh, it, it established kind of a, a lot of very useful terminology and provided kind of a, a, a view of the, the landscape of, of what the different elements are in, in many of these programs. Uh, that report um, with how quickly some of these programs have changed, evolved, and grown, that report is already out of date, and a lot of the content um, needed to be updated. Um, but in addition to that, um, there are new lessons learned, um, new uh, you know practices kind of gleaned. You know, if you approach X, Y, and Z this way, you're going to have a better time or an easier time, you know, with say traffic incident management or something along those lines. Um, the uh, so what we're trying to do here. Is, um, is is basically identify those new elements. Also, what the different, you know, if there's somebody who's trying to get an SSP program off the ground, they're having some, they're running into certain different hurdles, not just sharing the experience that other people have had. Now they've gotten around those, but um, the uh, providing kind of a landscape of, of other things to kind of be aware of. Uh, the idea is here is that, um, you know, Federal Highway and, and other groups have developed things like capability maturity models, CMMs, which uh, kind of help you see, you know, a little down the road as your program advances, advances and matures, um, the different partnerships you need to establish, the different um, technologies and practices you need to have in play um, in order to kind of uh, get ahead of those and avoid uh, having, a, you know, hurdles in the future. So we're, we're really trying to kind of come up with a, um, a good framework, uh, something that, that captures the different dimensions, the different variables that we've seen. Um, and again, these programs vary greatly from program to program. Um, so having something that, you know, it's not a one size fits all. Um, there are definitely different considerations that kind of highlight different features, uh, more or less. Um, and uh, we also want it to be a useful document. Um, if it was, you know, least common denominator, we would basically say, yeah, there's trucks and there's people and they respond to stuff. And that's, you know, that's not going to be useful to anybody. So um, we really do want to provide something that's useful and provide some insight and help um, in, in, a, in a good structure. So uh, our earlier chapters do that. We also have uh, information on vehicle loadouts uh, and traffic management plans, and this will be published. We were intending to publish it as a Volpe report, um, but... Um, We'll, we'll see. Um, this is uh, it's up to the PFS members um, uh, how we handle the uh, the final product. So um, again, if you have uh, thoughts and you want to weigh in one way or another, uh, consider uh, linking up with the with the PFS um, and uh, uh, so you can vote on that. Uh, next slide, please. Again, this is just an overview of the structure. Um, uh, there's a uh, a lot of key arguments to be made for PFSs. Um, they significant improvements to um, freeway operations, uh, to improvements to reliability, um, and uh, it, it, to, to safety for for the motoring public. And um, there are um, different programs that found different ways of articulating this to different crowds that uh, different audiences that uh, landed a little uh, better, you know, more effectively, and or just you know, went unheard. So one of the things we tried to do in the earlier chapter is uh, basically explain, making the case for the PFS and explaining the, the value that they do add, consolidating that information so that anybody else is trying to look for that and say, make, you know, discuss why am I even looking at this? Why am I looking at improving this program um, uh, and enhancing it that they have, they're armed with the materials and the, the content that they need um, to develop like a, a good, you know, kind of outreach slide deck. Um, we also have some you know, provide that overview structure material in chapter two. We're going to dive into that um, uh, in, in this in this webinar. Um, and uh, chapter three of those common incidents and response strategies. We really tried to uh, ca capture everything that we know PFSs to uh, respond to and and kind of classify them. Not just the um, these are the different incidents and this is the different um, these are the different. Uh, uh, traffic control setups, but um, what the different important critical functions and elements to do during each one of these incidents are, whether it's, you know, advanced driver warning, um, driver awareness, et cetera, um, that, you know, what are the different steps that that the PFS does kind of uh, take into account and, and well, not, not necessarily steps, but more the objectives, what needs to actually be accomplished um, to have a safe and effective incident management um, as reported by the PFS members. 
Um, and then of course, um, safety service patrol vehicles, a lot of folks were really curious as to what people are using for trucks platforms and what equipment they have on their trucks. And this actually varied a significant amount more than I was actually expecting. Um, uh, everything from, uh, you know, we don't allow our drivers to have hand tools because then that encourages them to try and fill like, you know, fix like a broken timing belt or something like that. And they're not mechanics, so they're liable, you know, the program gets sued if they try to do that. Um, so there's no hand tools in the truck to the exact opposite. There are hand tools in the truck. If they need a wrench and they don't have a wrench, that's a problem. So, um, I was, we, we weren't expecting to see such variety in, in the different truck loadouts and, and the reason, the very good and strong rationale for, and against, uh, including certain pieces of equipment, but, um, that, uh, all that will kind of be discussed in that, in that chapter four of the report. Next slide, please. So chapter two, this is just a big overview. Um, the, uh, again, makes the argument in, you know, why the SSPs are important um, and the gen general goals and objectives and the roles that SSP programs play in ha uh, having an effective um, transportation system. Um, and then, you know, those core functions and then uh, the important components and elements. Um, next slide, please. Chapter 2.5 is the one that talks about those important components. And this is the one that gets, uh, this is the portion of the chapter that gets like the most amount of attention. And it, it kind of talks about the various um, uh, pieces and considerations. Um, we, again, we're trying to structure this so that it can slide, if, if, if this is something the PFS folks are interested in doing, that the content could slide into, uh, say, a capability maturity model. So folks can take this content and then kind of self-assess and figure out. Um, we basically use that to see what's what's down the line. And, and, and if they were looking to, um, enhance or alter their program. Uh, what are the next few things that they need? They should be looking on, uh, looking for down the road. Next slide, please. This is some of the. I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the content, some of our high-level findings here within this. Um, this is uh, uh, again, these programs vary greatly, significantly from program to program, and they are, um, you know, it, these variations are. My apologies, my headset just died. Um, the can you hear me? Yeah, you can. We can hear you, Andy. I was just thinking. Yeah, do, we probably should wrap this up. Um, you know, go high level from here. My apologies. Yeah. Was... Um, yeah. The uh, I'll only go with the. Uh, uh, we can actually skip this one. Uh, skip the slide. Um, uh, obviously, training certifications. We already talked about that. Fleet size and comp composition. Call centers. Um, uh, and, and the partnerships that are used to uh, kind of staff these call centers, these are all elements that can be very expensive. So uh, if you, you know, if you can kill two birds with one stone, if you can provide two different services with, you know, one call center, or um, if you can provide three or four, some states have actually figured out how to do you, you make the dollar that you've invested in your program, go, go further. Some of these states have found unbelievably effective methods and, and solutions for, um, uh, staffing their, you know, addressing their staffing needs and, um, and doing it in a very cost-effective way, um, that benefits all parties and, uh, um, you know, who are, who are uh, present. Next slide, please. Um, as we talked about funding and uh, one of the things we wanted to talk about was sponsorship. Um, there are pros and cons to certain sponsorship, uh, relationships that uh, folks had kind of talked about in, during our meetings, um, and disclosed, um, uh, although those are not, None of this is ever going to be attributed to any state within the report or anything else like that. Um, it is important to know um, what what it means to get sponsorship, what that means in terms of uh, composition, but then also what reporting, additional reporting is usually required uh, when you do that and um, and basically how to how to keep that uh, sponsor relationship um, uh, good and healthy um, uh, throughout the, the life of your program. Legislation was one of the areas where um, a lot of folks, they, they, this is, you know, every state has different laws, every state has a different setup, and um, there's significant variance from state to state, but uh, overall, there are um, a few areas where additional uh, legislation uh, would help almost every single state um, in strengthening uh, their, their programs and also kind of uh, benefiting their drivers. 
Um, and you can think of things like the move over law where every, you know, all 50 states and, you know, DC and Puerto Rico now have their own move over law and adopted some version of it. Um, you know, it, it, that's, it, it, it took, you know, up until like, you know, four or five years ago for something like that to happen. So it's not, um, you know, the legislation is still a, a moving target. Um, uh, stakeholders, partnerships, and programs and relationships. This is something that um, some states uh, uh, hammer out a little harder than other states. Um, there are very good reasons for establishing very strong working relationships with the other people, not only who are going to be on site um, and stakeholders within your program, but also elevating uh, the visibility of your program and, and some of the practices that not only some people have reported doing, but some of the ones that we've actually seen people doing. Um, to help elevate the visibility of their program um, so that everybody understands fully the benefit that they actually do provide um, for the transportation network and that the public sees that and understands that, that there is reliable traffic savings, that there's reliability and safety reasons for it. And it's not just a helping the one or two, you know, helping somebody out who's like, you know, stranded on the side of the road, the, the few the few instances that they see that, you know, 30 minutes that they're behind the, the wheel. Um, but uh, policies and procedures um, and legal agreements are, are obviously a, a kind of critical to this as well. Next slide, please. Um, there was a couple final thoughts that um, uh, we had some early early things that we had noticed, um, uh, and and these are these are things that we've we've shared again with the um, SSP members, and uh, some of these are. Um, not they're they're varying in utility, um, but they're they're kind of things that were noticed across the board. Um, one of the things that it's not included in here is is the critical role of evaluation and the um, uh, availability of of data to kind of talk about performance. We always talk about outputs and outcomes when we do evaluation on the federal side. Outputs is the uh, the amount of activity you've done, um, and then outcomes is did it actually have the did it have the intended outcome. So you could think of like an enforcement campaign for speeding. Um, number of citations written for speeding, um, number of times that somebody was out on patrol would be the outputs, and then the outcome would be measuring like a, a reduction in speed on those corridors, um, uh, so that it, you know bringing things down to a safe speed. Um, the um, when it comes to measuring outputs for SSPs, you you know this uh, ticketing program, the ticketing, there's different ways that people do track that and try to quantify it. Um, there's certain portions of it that are harder to quantify because it's not responded to an event, not responded to an event. Some of these events are horrific. Some of them are, are unbelievably difficult to deal with um, in a difficult situation, et cetera. And you have to also kind of quantify the, find a way to quantify the um, the size of the um, size scale and scope magnitude of each one of these events and, and that they've responded to. Um, and uh, when it comes to the outcomes, it is hard to, on the operations side, to isolate just the impacts of one um, one practice and like, what did the SSPs do for, um, uh, you know, uh, the operational improvement on, you know, this corridor when you've also have ITS solutions and other things. So, um, they talked about the, the critical need for a good evaluation numbers so that, you know, value added can be actually shown, but the difficulties that exist there. Um, and, um, uh, we learned there's a, there's a lot on the liability side where, um, uh, the, that also is, is, is um, it's, it feels like it's low hanging fruit, but it's not. Um, uh, and then the final thing would be the, the near need for a career path um, uh, that uh, having an existing you know, job series or title that transcends, uh, you know, goes state cross state borders that that would actually be beneficial to the entire practice. Uh, we can skip the last two slides and go right to the poll. Um, anybody that has any information on their, uh, state SSP, um, please, <laughs> please give your name and region if you're willing to, um, participate and, uh, and, and send us uh, some of your information. Um, if anybody has any thoughts or comments, um, anything to, you know, it, is is what we talked about is this going to be useful um, for your state for your region is there something that you think that um, could be added to this report to um, and make it more useful uh, feel free to either drop it in the chat or chime in
Yeah, so I, so Andy, thanks very much. Really appreciate it. Um, I know we're still getting answers. Was there another poll? No, that was it. Okay. Um, my two close friends there, um, see it on the screen. Um, so I, just to reiterate some of my interest, which are more members to the pool fund study. So we're looking to have, um, you know, other states. I see that um, uh, Terry's going to try to get Connecticut to participate. Um, you know, there's, there's 16 states, but there's many more programs out there and everyone could, you know, could benefit by it. And, the, you know, the annual meetings coming up in May, there's time to make your contribution. What the uh, annual meeting, um, um, travel to the annual meeting is covered in that contribution for one member, but we're, we're willing to open it up to others, um, depending on who you are and what your interest is. Um, you know, if, if, um, you know, if, if a state wants to send more than one person or if a state that's not participating has a reason that they want to, that they want to come, we'll, we can look at that. So that's, that's it in May in Boston, Cambridge, actually. Um, yeah, there's, uh, um, you know, and then, you know, what Andy said, uh, and, you know, is that, you know, the results um, will, will, will be a, um, a modified version of what, what we come up with. We'd like to publish something. Some of the information was provided to us with the idea yeah, that it wouldn't be published for whatever reason. Uh, some of the states have their concerns about that, but it was given for the research only, not necessarily for public publication. So we'll have to uh, clean it and, and see what is acceptable to the pool fund study members. So while um, Jim and I manage the pool fund study, we we you know it, it's it's everyone's project. It's not really uh, you know I, I I have to make some decisions, but mostly it's about about um, financing and things like that. So uh, it's not, you know, I'm not making the research decisions. Uh, it's the team that's, that's doing that. So um, with that, uh, everyone always asked if we can have a copy of the slide presentation. <laughs> there, there'll be, uh, this will be recorded and posted on the NOCO website um, within a few weeks. And um, not necessarily the PowerPoints, um, I don't think are, are available I think something changed with NOCO that we can't do that. So um, sorry about that. If you have a specific question, but uh, just let us know. We can try to get you that. Um, I know that uh, we only have a few more minutes left, but um, I'd like to call on Don. Don, did we miss anything? Did Andy miss anything? Does he need to be scolded for anything? Do you know, Don? Oh, I would never dare. <laughs> never. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. You know what? I think Andy gave a great overview of the the scope of the the pooled fund study, and as as I imagine, everyone can appreciate the um the amount of information is, as he pointed out, not only vast but incredibly diverse. And so one of the, the great tasks here is to try, as he, I think, also alluded to, is to try to figure out um, what will be most useful to the pooled fund study members. And so that's part of where the collaboration comes in when we bring back everything that we've learned and discuss it and have the pooled fund study members discuss it and figure out, you know, where they want to take the next steps from here. I mean, we can we can give them options to consider. Um, but, you know, they are the, the folks doing the work. So they will, you know, they will drive the, the research and figure out where we're going to go from here. And we'll, you know, we will do our best to gather the data and to um, give them what they need to, you know, to improve their projects and to, you know, make this, uh, this endeavor safer for everyone who participates in it. Absolutely. So John, John, um, John Sullivan from uh, Tennessee. Uh, you want to know which states are participating? Jennifer showed that in a slide, um, but we we maybe we could show if if I don't know Don if you have. Uh, um, I know um, Cardio had sent us that list the other day, but but Tennessee is participating um, in that. John um, for sure. Um, they weren't able to attend the annual meeting, but they they've contributed contributed and they're participating. 
So, and I know you're from Tennessee. So, um, and I think uh, there was a question early on from um, Owen, Owen Hassan from Missouri. And he wanted to know about, um, and I don't know that we have the question here on, um, you know, as you know, with the large data requirements and different drones, are we storing the data or are we, uh, or is it live? I think that my, my uneducated answer is, I think it's a combination. Um, but Jennifer, do you, what do you guys do guys? Is it just live data? You, are you storing any of that? The, the drone, I mean, the, the drone? Um, we do not store any data. We have a policy against even um, recording camera images. So what we do though, is there's a link. Um, again, there's two different units that we have. One is easier than the other to get information back to the TMC, but one provides a link that can be sent um, where you can get a live stream video. Um, and we send that to our uh, TMC and our partner, you know, agencies that are interested in seeing the video, um, but we don't record anything. We we may record for training purposes just to be able to show, you know, like a video on this PowerPoint, but nothing that we keep. Okay. All right. And and before we, we only have a few minutes left, but um, I'd be remiss in not calling on, um, if you're still on, um, I haven't let my partner, Joe Tebow, talk Talk at all today. Uh, Jim Moss was just not available. But Joe, you any anything? Um, sorry, if I didn't call on you sooner. No, it's all good, Paul. Uh, thanks for all the good info. Yeah, your safety service patrols are being highlighted a lot this month, it seems. And there's so many great things going on out there um, that uh, uh, it, it's all about the it's all about keeping people safe and you know even saving lives. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm just uh, dazzled by it. I was at the ITS conference uh, earlier today in Baltimore and and um, safety service patrols and the technology associated with them was highlighted. And, you know, it, it, it's just it's just a, a, a great thing to see it evolving. So thanks for all that you do. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Joe. So while Jim and I have a lot of experience in the uh, safety service patrol business, Joe is much experience in many things. Um, firefighter, 44 years, uh, EMS uh, certifications, and many other uh, backgrounds that support Tim. So um, we didn't need another Jim and Paul. So that's why we were happy to, we got a job with our team three years ago. So so the pool fund study members are listed there, Don, put it in there. So listen, if you're, if you're a manager, go ask your research money, your research um, office for 25,000 for this fiscal year to participate. Uh, you don't have to follow up with previous years uh, contributions or anything like that. Just um, and if you're if you know the pool fund study member uh, manager uh, and you're not one, um, tell them about this great program. There's some really really good conversations and cool people that are participating uh, in those. We in, enjoy the conversations as much as uh, well, even more than the research. Um, so uh, it's um, just really would appreciate if you push it along to everybody. So. Um, with that, any closing thoughts? Any anybody? I was supposed to have open discussion. We never get to it, but next next month we will. I promise. So next month, remember, um, is not no talking, Tim. It would interfere with Thanksgiving, and um, and we also uh, have that um, CRSW kickoff webinar on the thirteenth on it's a Monday of that cross responder safety week. Please, please, please share with your partners. We want to have a big crew, a uh, big group, a lot of participation, a lot of a lot of um, good, um, good, good presentations uh, are planned for that that event uh, in recognition of, of crash responders. So, with that, why don't we wrap it up? Unless anyone else has got anything final to add. Nope, that's it. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. For joining us we'll talk to you on the 13th not sooner thanks everybody take care